Lecture number 10, the Sangha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. The Buddha's dispensation is founded upon three guiding ideals. These three guiding ideals or objects of veneration are the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The Buddha is the teacher, the Dharma is the teaching, and the Sangha is the community of those who live in accordance with the teaching. These three are together called the Three Jewels or Triple Gem. They are called the Three Jewels because for one who is seeking the way to liberation, they are the most precious things in the world, rarer and more precious than the most valuable gem. So far we've discussed the Buddha and the Dhamma. In this concluding talk in the series, we'll speak about the third jewel, the Sangha. The word Sangha means those who are joined together, thus a community. However, the word Sangha doesn't refer to the entire Buddhist community. It doesn't mean the totality of Buddhists or even the totality of those who are committed to the Buddhist path. The word Sangha signifies a smaller community within the larger Buddhist society. In particular, it refers to two such communities, making for two kinds of Sangha. One of these is called the Arya Sangha the community of noble ones, also called the Savaka Sangha, the community of the Buddha's true disciples. The other is the conventional Sangha, the Samuti Sangha, that is the order of bhikkhus, of fully ordained monks. Theoretically, the conventional Sangha also includes bhikkhunis, that is fully ordained nuns. However, in Theravada Buddhist countries, the full ordination lineage for women has become defunct, even though there continue to exist independent orders of nuns. These we'll discuss later in the talk. The Aryan Sangha is the community of noble persons, all those who have reached the supramundane paths and fruits. This Sangha consists of eight types of individuals joined together into four pairs that's mentioned in the salutation of the Sangha Yadidang Chitari Purisa Yugani Atta Purisa Pugala the Sangha made up of the eight types of individuals joined together into four pairs the four pairs are the person on the path of stream entry and the stream enterer the person on the path of the once-returner and the once-returner, the person on the path of non-returning and the non-returner, and the person on the path of arhatship and the arhat. The path experience lasts for only a single moment, and thus the first type of each pair can only be found at that one single moment of the path. But because the mental structure of the person at this stage is somewhat different from that of the person at the immediately following stage, the stage of the fruit. He's counted as a different type. But for practical purposes, there are really four main kinds of noble disciples. The stream enterer, the once returner, the non-returner, and the arahant. What unites all these persons and makes them a sangha, a community, is that they all share a penetration through direct experience of the innermost essence of the Dhamma. All these persons have followed the Buddha's path to the heights of wisdom and seen for themselves the ultimate truth, the truth of the unconditioned. The experience that makes a person an Aryan disciple is called the arising of the eye of Dhamma. We all have physical eyes by which we can see form. We also have mental eyes by which we can understand ideas intellectually. 
But what the Aryan person has that the ordinary person lacks is the Dhamma Chaku, the eye of truth, the penetrating vision that sees into the real nature of things, that sees right through the process of arising and dissolving of all conditioned things to the unconditioned element, Nibbana. By arousing the eye of Dhamma, the noble person has cut off the first three fetters, the fetters of personality view, doubt, and clinging to rules and rituals. Such a person has absolute confidence in the triple gem, in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. He can never point to any other teacher than the Buddha or take as his guiding principles any other teaching than the Dhamma. He's been, in a sense, stirred spiritually reborn, born with a noble birth. It is the profound experience of the Dhamma that makes a person a member of the Aryan Sangha, a true disciple of the Buddha. The Aryan, the status of the Aryan Sangha is not established by any formal act of ordination. It's not restricted to monks and nuns. Most members of the monastic Sangha are not Aryans, but worldlings, Tutujanas. And any person, monk or nun, layman or laywoman, who penetrates the Dhamma, who arouses the eye of Dhamma, immediately becomes a member of the Aryan Sangha. Lay persons living at home can reach all four levels of liberation. But those lay people who become arhans, very few, and when they do so, they automatically renounce the household life and enter the monastic order. Of course, to continue in the household life, they need a certain minimum of attachment, which is lacking when our hardship is reached. Those who become Aryans have entered the definite path to final liberation. They can never fall back to the level of a worldling. They've stepped beyond the ranks of the multitude, caught up in craving and, ig and ignorance, revolving in birth and death. They're now bound to reach full enlightenment and final liberation. The highest of the noble disciples is the Arahant. He is the one who will never come back to any form of existence, high or low. He has reached enlightenment right in this body. He's cut off all of his craving. He ex extinguished all defilement. And he lives out his days in the bliss of liberation until with the breakup of the body, with his passing away, he attains the final goal, the Nibbana element without residue. The Aryan Sangha is the jewel of the Sangha, the Sangha Ratana in the highest sense. It is this Sangha that functions as one of the three refuges when Buddhists recite Sangang Sadanangachami. I go for refuge to the Sangha. They're referring to the Aryan Sangha, to the, the community of noble disciples. The Aryan Sangha is absolutely necessary to the Buddha's dispensation. Whether Aryans continue to appear in this world or not, it's absolutely essential for the Buddha's teaching that it should turn out an Aryan Sangha, at least for some time. The reason the Aryan Sangha is so important is because it is the noble disciples who stand as living proof of the truth of the Buddha's teaching. The Aryans are the one who have put the teaching to the test who've practiced the path and verified the Dhamma in their own experience. They are the ones who have accomplished the aim of the Dhamma. The Buddha's teaching aims at transforming men and women from ordinary people, from worldlings, into noble people, into Aryans, at bringing them to the stages of liberation. The Aryans show that the teaching is effective in accomplishing that aim, these are the ones who have reached the different planes of liberation and can speak about them from direct experience. They are the guides and models. In their own person, they encourage us to follow the path. 
since they began as ordinary people like ourselves, but by practicing the path has risen up above the ordinary plane and reached the state of, no of spiritual nobility. And through their own attainments, they can give effective instruction to others. Instruction that's not based on mere guesswork or book learning, but that's based on personal experience. The second type of Sangha, as we said, is the conventional Sangha, the monastic order. The monastic order is called the conventional Sangha because admission to the order depends entirely on the convention of ordination, which can be given to any properly qualified candidate. It doesn't require any special spiritual attainment, but simply a person who wishes to enter the order and is free from any of the conditions that obstruct ordination. The conventional sangha, the monastic order, is not a jewel or a refuge in the highest sense. However, it is still a jewel in a secondary sense. In Buddhism, the monastic sangha is regarded as extremely precious, worthy of deep reverence and respect. And this is so for two basic reasons. First, because the members of the sangha continue to follow the holy life laid down by the Buddha in its fullness. And secondly, because the members of the sangha transmit the teaching of the Buddha from generation to generation to generation. They keep the Dhamma alive in the world. The Buddha established the Sangha in order to provide ideal conditions for reaching the Aryan state, for attaining enlightenment and realizing Nibbana. When the Buddha was still a Bodhisattva, when he went out in search of enlightenment, he did so by first renouncing the household life by becoming a monk himself. Then, after he attained enlightenment, he established the Sangha as the resort for other people who were seriously bent on dedicating themselves to the task of spiritual cultivation, of reaching the supreme goal here and now. The bhikkhus who take ordination into the order are those who have followed the Buddha into the state of homelessness. They take on the Buddha's mode of practice, they wear his robe, and they live according to his rule. The Buddha laid down the brahmacharya, the holy life, as the way to deliverance, and the monastic state provides the optimal conditions possible in this world for living the holy life that was intended by the Buddha. Aryans do not arise only from the monastic sangha, but it is those persons who become monks and nuns who have the best opportunities for practicing to reach the Aryan state. The second reason why the monastic order is revered so high, highly, as we said, is that the monks have the function of transmitting the Buddha's dispensation. They keep alive the practice, the way of life established by the Buddha, they show to others burdened by the cares of household life that it's possible to live a life of purity, of renunciation, of restraint, meditation, and realization. By training disciples, they ensure that the Buddha's dispensation is passed on from one generation to another so that it doesn't disappear from the world. By studying the scriptures, by teaching them, they preserve the verbal teaching of the Buddha. They make sure that it's spread and propagated for the welfare of others. For these reasons, the monastic Sangha stands as a field of merit, worthy of respects, offerings, and support. The story of the monastic order goes back even before the ordination of the first bhikkhus to the time the future Buddha was a prince in the palace. When he went on his outside expedition and saw the old man, the sick man, and the dead man, then his mind was deeply disturbed and all of his confidence and household life was shattered. Then the fourth sight he saw was a contemplative ascetic walking peacefully through the town 
wearing rag robes, with shaven head, carrying an arms bowl. And this man indicated to the prince, Siddhartha, the course he himself had to adopt to find liberation. And so when the night of his great renunciation arrived, the prince followed that man's example by cutting off his hair and beard, putting on yellow robes, and leaving the palace for the life of a mendicant. And his own practice in this regard has provided the model for the Sangha through the centuries. Each monk, when he goes forth, does so in imitation of the original renunciation of the Buddha. The actual formation of the Sangha took place soon after the Buddha gave his first discourse. When the Buddha had finished explaining the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path to the five ascetics in the Dirpa, the oldest of the five ascetics, Kandanya, gained the first stage of enlightenment the stage of stream entry. After he had seen the Dhamma for himself, he bowed down to the Buddha and acknowledged the Buddha as his teacher. And then he asked the Buddha to ordain him as his disciple. He wanted to become a monk under the Buddha. The Buddha then ordained him simply with, by saying, Come, Bhikkhu, the Dhamma is well proclaimed. Live the holy life for the complete ending of suffering. Thus, with these words, Kandanya became the first bhikkhu, the first monk disciple of the Buddha. But one bhikkhu doesn't make up a sangha. The sangha is a community, and that means, in formal terms, a minimum of four monks required to constitute the sangha. But on that occasion, the Buddha continued to explain the Dhamma to the other four ascetics, who were named Bhadya, Mahanama, Vapa, and Asaji. And when they gained stream entry after his talk, they also asked to become bhikkhus under the Buddha, and the Buddha admitted them with the same word. When the Buddha accepted them as bhikkhus, at that very moment the Sangha was formed for the first time, a community of five monks headed by the Buddha. Shortly after that, the Buddha taught them the truth of anatta, of egolessness. And at the end of this discourse, the five monks achieved enlightenment, destroying all defilements, and became arhats, fully liberated in mind. In the months and years ahead, the Sangha continued to expand very rapidly. And the reasons for its rapid growth are not so hard to understand. The age in which the Buddha lived was a period when spiritual ideals occupied first place in the scale of human values. It was not at, like a time like our own time in which material values are predominant. However, in the time of the Buddha, the prevalent religions failed to meet the spiritual needs of the people. The religion of the Brahmins was bogged down by superstition, ritual, sacrifice, and by artificial distinctions based on caste. And the non-Brahminic religious orders were given up to either extreme asceticism or to dry speculation. In contrast to all of these other teachings, the Buddha offered a clear and direct path to the highest goal, a path that was completely in accordance with reason, that was open to personal verification, and that was very appealing in its simplicity and in its practicality. And so many young men, from even from the highest classes, were drawn to the Buddha and wanted to lead the monastic life under his guidance. We shouldn't think that these young men which came only from the poor and the downtrodden. To the contrary, most of them came from the higher social classes. They included the young Brahmins, the sons of wealthy merchants, aristocrats, princes, also kings, farmers, and also those who are less fortunate, since the Buddha didn't make any class distinction. It included outcasts, poor people, beggars, and so on. The order grew very rapidly, and by the time the Buddha passed away, it contained thousands and thousands of members, and it was spread out throughout a good, a good part of northern India. The key move which characterizes the act of becoming a monk is renunciation. 
The initial act of entering the monastic order is called pavaja, which literally means going forth, going forth from the household life into homelessness. Over and over again we read in the Buddhist text that some householder or a young man, after listening to the Buddha explain the Dhamma, gains confidence in the master. When he gains his confidence, he reflects upon the household life thus, in the words of the text, he thinks, the household life is confining, a path for the dust of passion. The homeless life is free as the open air. It's difficult, while living at home, to lead the pure and perfect life of homelessness. I'll cut off my hair and beard, put on the saffron robes, and go forth from the household life into homelessness. Then we read that sometime later that same person leaves his circle of relatives, whether they be large or small, he leaves his accumulation of wealth, whether it be large or small, he cuts off his hair and beard, puts on the saffron robes, approaches the order, and takes ordination, entering the life of homelessness. Now there are some people, especially in the West, who admire the Buddha and his teaching, but find themselves put off by the Sangha. They feel something repellent in the in a religious system that issues in monasticism. They prefer to see a spiritual path that can be adapted to life in the world rather than one that leads away from worldly life into monastic life. Now, such people might be justified in wishing to see a Dharma that can be practiced in the world. And this is true also about the Buddha's teaching, that it's applicable for those who are living in household life. But anyone who's correctly grasped the drift of the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma, will see at once that the path of renunciation follows from it with complete naturalness. The Buddha teaches that life in the world is inseparably connected with dukkha, with suffering and unsatisfactoriness. Worldly existence is a round of becoming, leading us again and again into birth and death and into all the different forms of suffering. And the reason we remain bound to the wheel of becoming is because of our attachment to it. We hang on to it through our cravings a desire for pleasure, for power, for continued existence. To gain release from the round, we have to extinguish our craving. And that is the highest renunciation, the ultimate act of renunciation, the inner act of finally cutting off all attachments, even the most subtle. But to win through to that attainment, we generally have to start with simple common, relatively easy acts of renunciation. And as these gather force, they eventually lead us to a point where we no longer feel attracted to the laws of secular life, where our desire to be free from the bondage of worldly life overpowers all desire for the pleasures of the world. And when this happens, we become ready to leave behind the household life to enter upon the homeless state in order to devote ourselves fully to the task of removing the inner subtle clingings of the mind. The homeless life is not absolutely essential to this work. True renunciation is an inner act, not a mere outer one. But as we said before, the homeless life provides the most suitable outer conditions for practicing true renunciation conditions which are helpful for most people, even if they're not indispensable for everyone. The holy life requires purified conduct, but household life stimulates many desires that run contrary to pure conduct. The homeless life is a life of meditation calling for constant mindfulness, clear awareness, and contemplation. All this requires time, a calm environment, freedom from external pressures and responsibilities. 
It's difficult for those living the family life to find the leisure and opportunity to devote themselves single-heartedly to the work of spiritual development in its highest aspects. To provide such an objective situation, the Buddha founded the Sangha, a community of men and women who can live together in a spirit of harmony and mutual support, devoting themselves to the practice of the Dhamma. The bhikkhu, the Buddhist monk, it should be said, is not a priest. He does not function as the intermediary between the laity and any divine power, not even between the layman and the Buddha. He does not administer sacraments, pronounce absolution, or perform any rituals needed by lay people for salvation. The main task of the bhikkhu, of the Buddhist monk, is to cultivate himself along the path laid down by the Buddha, the path of moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. Entrance into the Sangha, we should also say, is not binding for lifetime. One who becomes a Buddhist monk doesn't take lifelong vows. In some Buddhist traditions, especially in Sri Lanka, it's expected that those who take the higher ordination as bhikkhus will remain in the road for life. But it's not absolutely essential, and if a person takes ordination and finds he's unsuited for monastic life, he's free at any time to leave the robe and return to lay life without any kind of religious blame attaching to him, without incurring any kind of obstruction to his spiritual progress. In other countries like Burma and Thailand, it's customary for just about all males at some time in their life to take one nation for a short period in the Sangha. In Thailand, generally for one rainy season of three months. After that, the young man is considered to be a fit candidate for marriage. In Burma, it's customary for many young children, young men, to, or young boys to take one nation as novices. And for older men, after they've lived their full life, to enter the order in old age. The distinctive marks of the bhikkhu in all the Buddhist countries and most Buddhist traditions are the shaved head and the saffron robe. As it says in the stock passage that we already read, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the saffron robe, and goes forth into homelessness. Some people nowadays object to this distinct appearance of the bhikkhu, particularly in the United States. They think that the Buddhist monk has to change with the times, that he should conform to the society in which he lives. And so in this age and in this country, he should appear like everybody else, perhaps wearing his robes only when performing religious services or when teaching the Dharma. However, these ideas do not accord with the specific nature of the bhikkhu's vocation. Even in the days of the Buddha, the bhikkhu had a distinct apparent appearance from lay people. His robe and his shaved head were never the common custom of the people. They always served to mark the monk out as different from others. The reason the bhikkhu adopts this appearance is rooted in the very nature of his calling. For one thing, the Buddhist monk seeks to realize the truth of anatta, of selflessness. And this means the relinquishing of one's claims to stand out as a special individual, to be a somebody. The aim of the bhikkhu is to become a man of naught, to reach total effacement, not in the sense of becoming a nameless nobody, but in eliminating the sense of ego, of self-identification. Now our clothes, our hairstyle, our beard, often become ways in which we, subtle ways in which we assert our sense of identity, by which we try to express our self-image or to realize our personality. The bhikkhus seek to overcome this claim to self-assertion by adopting a mode of appearance that is the same as all other bhikkhus. They give up their individual color 
in order to blend imperceptibly into the larger body, the body of the Sangha. Also, the robe and the shaved head remind the bhikkhu of his special vocation. One of the themes for daily reflection the Buddha taught to the monks is to think, my way of life is different from that of worldly people. The common people flow with the stream of desires, of grasping, of becoming. The monk has to strive against the stream. He lives a life of restraint, self-control, and inner cultivation. Because the defilements in his mind might still be active, he often needs some special sign to remind him of his high mission, his calling to seek deliverance. The distinctive dress gives him that reminder. It lets him know that he wears the same robe that the Buddha wore, that he has the same appearance as the Buddha, and therefore that he should remain firm in his resolution to strive along the path of the Buddha. The special robe also serves another purpose, one which is directed outwardly towards others rather than towards himself. That is, the robe is the token of the Buddha's teaching. The monk represents the Buddha's teaching before the world at large. His manner, his conduct, his mode of deportment have the the effect of impressing on others the fruits of training in the Buddha's discipline. If his conduct is pure and his manner is lofty, other people will be favorably impressed. And as a result, they will gain confidence in the Buddha's Dhamma. But in order for the bhikkhu to make others aware of the fruits of the Buddha's training, he needs a distinctive dress that singles him out as a disciple of the Buddha. And that is the reason for the robe. Another special aspect of the lifestyle of the Buddhist monk is that he lives in dependence on the offerings of others. He doesn't work for his living at a remunerative job. He doesn't receive payment and money for his religious services. But he lives entirely in dependence on the support of the laity. Those who have confidence in the Dhamma provide him with his basic requisites, his robes, his food, his dwelling place, medicines, and whatever simple material support he might need. The idea of a monastic order supported by the laity often causes trouble for people in the West. In the West, especially in modern America, we've been conditioned to believe that all capable people, at least men, ought to work for their living. We feel that it's morally wrong for an able-bodied man to live on the offerings of others. Sometimes it's asked what right the monk or nun has to ask for the support of his society. And what does the Sangha give the society in return? First of all, we have to say that the monks and nuns do not ask society for support. In fact, the code of monastic discipline prohibits the monks from asking lay people for for their material goods, except in the case of close relatives. The lay Buddhists offer the members of the Sangha their simple requisites freely, without any compulsion, without any pressure, without any sense of obligation forced on them. People give the monks the things they need as an expression of their faith in the Buddha's teaching. They give in the spirit of loving kindness, and because they want to help the monks lead the holy life profitably in order to reap its benefits. The monks and nuns who live in accordance with the Dharma These people are a blessing for the lay people who provide them with their requisites. And the benefits they provide can be found at several levels. First, at the most manifest level, they are able, by receiving the support, to become teachers of the Dharma. Because they are freed from the necessity to provide for themselves economically, they can study the Buddha's teaching, learn it thoroughly, and then teach it to others. Through their knowledge of the Dharma, they can guide others and teach others the principles that will lead to their spiritual welfare. Then, at a deeper level, the monks and nuns who receive the support maintain the tradition of Buddhist practice. 
especially the higher practices of meditation. They serve as, a, as an example for others. They serve as models of those who are pursuing the highest ideals. They show that the Dharma is not just a set of abstract theories, but a real path that can be practiced. They inspire others to undertake the practice and lead them along the way to liberation from suffering. A third benefit the Sangha provides is to serve as a field of merit for others. The Buddha teaches that giving or dana is a source of merit, and the merit that comes from giving is proportional to the purity of the recipient. When the receiver is a person striving for enlightenment and liberation, the highest goals, they become the most fruitful field of merit. By making gifts to the Sangha of robes, food, and so on, the lay people gain merit that will sustain them in their own quest for liberation, and which will bring them benefits in this life and in future lives. Perhaps the primary symbolic expression of the close relationship between Sangha and the lay people is the alms round. In the traditional Theravada Buddhist countries, especially Thailand and Burma, the monks acquire their food by walking from house to house with their alms bowls, gathering the offerings given to them by devoted lay people. When morning arrives, the monks put on their upper robes over both shoulders. They take their bowls and they leave their monasteries. Sometimes they go individually, sometimes in small groups sometimes in a long single file. They walk along silently and mindfully, without talking, their eyes cast down on the ground, their minds occupied with some theme for meditation. They keep the bowls beneath the folds of their robes. Then, whenever they pass a house where lay people have set up food for offerings, they stop, open their bowls, and silently receive what the people give them. After the lay person has given the monk his food, he usually bows down in respect, and the monk in turn will recite the short benediction, like Suki Hotu, may you be well, Ayu Vano Sukang Balang, may you achieve long life, beauty, happiness, and strength, and so on. As the monks walk along, they go to each house without making any distinctions or discriminations between rich and poor between those who are generous and those who are thrifty. But he gives everyone the opportunity to make an offering and thus to gain merit. The monk does not ask for anything. He's not a beggar. He receives whatever is offered, and if he gets nothing at a certain house, then he just passes on. The rule, as we said, specifically prohibits begging. After the bhikkhu has collected enough for his day's meal, then he returns to his monastery. There he'll take enough food for his own needs and share the rest with the other bhikkhus, the novices, and the monastery workers. In this way, the bhikkhu receives his material support and the lay people gain the chance to practice generosity and to acquire merit. The practice of going for alms round is burdensome for none and it's a source of joy for all parties concerned the monks, the lay people, and the hands in the monastery who require the offerings of the monks. There are two basic levels of monastic status in the Sangha, the rank of the Samanera and the rank of the Bhikkhu. A Samanera is a novice monk. A Bhikkhu is a fully ordained monk. The word Samanera means a little Samana or a little monk. A Samanera is one who has left the household life and entered the monastic fold, but he has not yet been fully admitted into the Sangha. He's still preparing for full ordination as a bhikkhu. He might have to undergo training for a period of several months or several years. So sometimes mature men who go forth are given the novice ordination and full ordination on the same day. The cer ceremony of becoming a Samanera is called 
Kabaja, the going forth from lay life into the homeless life. To become a Samanera, the candidate must be at least seven years old. He has to be physically fit, provided with robes, and he has to be accepted by a senior bhikkhu as a pupil. At the ceremony of ordination, the candidate approaches his preceptor with his head shaved and carrying his robes in his hands. He then asks the preceptor to be given the pabhaja, the going forth. The preceptor will then give him a short explanation of what this involves, he takes the robes from the Samanera and then he gives them back. And this marks the acceptance of the candidate as a Samanera. The new novice will then go off to the side, take off his lay clothes and put on the robes. Then he returns to his teacher and he asks the teacher to give him the three refuges and the ten precepts of a Samanera. The teacher will then recite the formula for the refuges and the ten precepts, the Samanera repeating them after the preceptor. And from then on, the Samanera must observe the ten basic precepts of the monastic life. These are first to abstain from killing or taking life, to abstain from taking what is not given, stealing. Third, to abstain from incelibacy. You have to lead a life of strict brahmacharya, of uh, strict chastity. Fourth, to abstain from lying. Fifth, to abstain from using from using intoxicants, drinks and drugs that cause intoxication. Sixth, to abstain from eating at the wrong time, which means from midday until the next morning. The monks take their food between dawn and midday, and from midday until the next dawn, they don't take any solid food, but only liquid drinks. Seventh, he has to abstain from singing, dancing, musical instruments, and from unsuitable shows. Seven, eighth, he has to abstain from using ornaments, scents, garlands, and perfumes that beautify the person. Seven, eighth, he has to abstain from using ornaments, scents, garlands, and perfumes that beautify the person. Ninth, he has to avoid high and luxurious seats and beds. And tenth, he has to abstain from accepting gold and silver, from accepting money. During his period of training as a Samanera, the young monk must study the Dhamma, he must learn the aspects of monastic discipline, and prepare himself for future full ordination. The ceremony of full ordination as a bhikkhu is called Upasampada. To be eligible for Upasampada, the candidate first has to have been a Samanera for some time, usually for several years. So as we said in the case of mature men, he might just have to have been ordained as a novice earlier the same day. The candidate for bhikkhu status must be 20 years old and he has to be free from the impediment. That is, he has to be free from certain incurable diseases like leprosy, tuberculosis, and epilepsy. He has to be a free man, not in debt. He has to be exempt from military service, and he has to have the permission of his parents. When he comes for the ordination ceremony, he must have a complete set of robes and an alms bowl. These will usually be provided by lay supporters. The ceremony of Upasampada requires a sangha of at least five bhikkhus, but usually more are present. The sangha is headed by a senior bhikkhu of at least ten years standing in the order who has a good knowledge of Dhamma and Vinaya, the code of discipline. This senior monk will serve as the preceptor for the new bhikkhu. The ordination is more complex than that used for the novice ordination. First, a monk will chant a motion that such and such, the name of the candidate, requests Upasampada with such and such a senior monk as his preceptor. Then three announcements of this fact are made. And if none of the bhikkhus present objects, then when the third announcement is finished, 
the candidate is accepted as a bhikkhu. After the actual ordination, the precept, preceptor then explains to the new bhikkhu the four things which are, which are absolutely prohibited for a fully ordained monk. These four acts are firstly engaging in sexual intercourse of any kind, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual. Secondly, taking anything of value that is not given. Third, killing another human being. And fourth, falsely claiming to have reached some higher spiritual attainment. If a bhikkhu commits any of these forbidden acts, then he is immediately expelled from the Sangha and he can never be reordained again in this lifetime. After explaining these four forbidden acts, the preceptor then explains the four supports of the homeless life. These are, first, to live on food collected on alms rounds. Secondly, to use robes made from cast-off rags. Third, to live beneath a tree. And fourth, to use cow's urine for medicine. But for the consolation of those who are thinking of taking ordination, it should be mentioned that these four observances are not compulsory. Monks are allowed to accept food offered by lay people in homes or brought to the monastery. They can wear robes already prepared by householders. They can live in buildings like temples and monasteries and cottages. And they can use any kind of proper medicine and don't have to use cow's urine at all. In fact, nowadays, in just about all Buddhist countries, the only one of the four supports which is commonly followed is to live on food collected on alms round. The others have pretty much fallen into neglect. But this formula is still recited as a, as a formality and as a way to emphasize the spirit of poverty, simplicity, and purity that are, are essential to the monk's life. The bhikkhu is allowed to own, as his own personal possession, eight articles. These include his three robes. One is the under robe, called the antaravasika, which is worn around the the waist, something like a sarang. The second robe is the upper robe, the uttarasanga, which is worn over the shoulder covering the upper part of the body. And the third robe is the double-thick outer robe, the sangati, which is usually worn only in cool weather. In addition to these three, the bhikkhu will own a belt made out of cloth, an alms bowl, a razor, a needle, and a water strainer. Besides these, in actual practice, bhikkhus usually own a few other simple necessities, varying in quantity according to their lifestyle. Teaching bhikkhus in the town will need more things, extra robes, books, note paper, pens, and so on. Meditative bhikkhus living in the forest can usually get by with very little beyond their basic re- requisites, perhaps just sandals, umbrella, a fan, a small clock. And the monk has to obtain his material re- requisites in a pure way. He doesn't work as a profes- at a profession, as we said, but he receives his material requisites to the generosity of others. He's not allowed to beg for them, to coerce others to give them, or to persuade others to offer them, but he's dependent upon the generosity and the kindness of the laity. And then using the four principal requisites, the robes, the alms food, his shelter and medicine, he has to reflect on their proper purposes. When he puts on his robes, he has to reflect that he uses the robes for the purpose of keeping off the cold, keeping off the heat, keeping off the sun and wind and creeping things, and for covering up the body. He reflects that he uses the alms food in order to support his life, to keep himself in good health, to prevent disease, and to live the life of holiness. He reflects that he uses his dwelling place, his shelter, to keep out the cold and heat and mosquitoes and gnats and in order to protect himself from the weather. And he reflects that he uses medicine for the purpose of keeping off disease and for the maximum of health and well-being. Life in the Sangha 
is regulated by a body of rules called the Vinaya. The word Vinaya literally means leading away. That is, it's the code of rules that leads us away from wrong actions, wrong deeds of body and speech. The Vinaya is contained in the part of the Tripitaka called the Vinaya Pitaka, the Book of Discipline. And these books set forth the precepts of monastic life. Some of these precepts are moral in nature and concerned with the fundamentals of spiritual development. Others are principles of etiquette more than morality, which help to establish harmony between the monks themselves and between the Sangha and laity as a whole. The heart of the Vinaya is the code of 227 rules called the Padimoka. These are the backbone of monastic discipline. The rules of the Patimoka are classified into several categories of differing degrees of moral weight. The most important are the four parajikas, the four prohibited acts we already mentioned, sexual intercourse, theft, killing another human being, and making false claims to spiritual attainment. The violation of these rules leads to defeat, to expulsion from the order. Thirteen other rules of a somewhat lesser degree of gravity lead to a period, if they're violated, they lead to a period of penance with a temporary suspension of monastic privileges. The remaining rules vary in importance and in the consequences that are entailed when they're violated. But for good monks, it's important that they try to keep all the rules as scrupulously as they can. All the rules might not seem to be extremely serious, but the problem is that once a person starts breaking minor rules, it's often only a matter of time until he starts to break major rules. Therefore, the guiding principle for a monk who's serious in following the Buddhist path is to try to maintain and protect all the rules to the best of his ability. The foundation of the higher stages of spiritual training is moral discipline. And for a bhikkhu, the background or backbone of his moral discipline is the patimoka. The patimoka is recited by the sangha together at a ceremony called the uposita, which is held on the day of the full moon and the new moon in each lunar month. It's held in the monastery whenever there are at least four bhikkhus living together. Before the ceremony takes place, the bhikkhus meet and confess their transgressions to one another. Then they all sit together, just separated by a few inches from one another, and one senior bhikkhu in the group will recite the Padimoka while all the others listen. And while it's being recited, if any monk remembers any transgression he's committed, then he will confess it before the group as a whole. Another special occasion of monastic life is the Vasa. The Vasa is a period of three months coinciding with the rainy season of India. That is, it lasts from the full moon day of July to the full moon day of October. And during these three months of the Vasa, the monks take up residence in a single dwelling without traveling outside, except in special cases, except in emergencies, or if their presence is required someplace. And the rule requiring the bhikkhus to observe the vasa was made by the Buddha because of the conditions in India during the time of the rain. When the rain fell, the earth would teem with vegetation, and insect life would become very abundant. So if the monks traveled around a lot, they would trample on the crop, kill insects, and ruin the people's fields. In order to prevent this, the Buddha laid down a rule requiring the monks to stay at a fixed abode for the period of three months. During this time, the lay people would provide them with their requisites and take care of the monks with great solicitude. And even now, even in countries where the rainy season doesn't come during the three-month period, it's traditional for the bhikkhus to observe the retreat 
of the rate of the bhakta. And during this period, the bhikkhus will devote themselves with special energy to their own spiritual work. The scholar monk will devote himself with special energy to study, the meditation monk to meditation, the literary monk will devote himself to writing. Each one will make a special effort to perfect himself in his own field during this period. At the close of the vasa, the bhikkhus will assemble and hold a ceremony which is called the pavarana. At the pavarana ceremony, each monk invites the other monks in the community to point out any wrong actions he might have committed during the vasa and to ask for the patience and forgiveness of the other monks for any wrongs he might have committed. Then, when the pavarana is finished, then the vasa is at an end. And usually, soon after the vasa ends, within a month after the end of the vasa, a major ceremony takes place bringing together the laity and the sangha, kind of symbolic expression of the unity of the Buddha's followers. This ceremony is called the Katina ceremony. At the Katina ceremony, the laity offer new robes to the monks who have observed the Vasa retreat. And they also bring other goods that might be needed at the temple or monastery. The Katina is almost always a very cheerful, colorful affair, which helps strengthen the bond of unity between lay people and the Sangha. All the monks, no matter what their age and standing might be, all share the same disciplinary code, the Patimoka and the rest of the Vinaya. And all the monks are guided by the same training, the training in moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. But beyond this, the members of the order divide into two basic types as they follow one or another of the two careers which are laid down for bhikkhus. One of these is called the Gantadura, the career of books, the path of study. The other is called the Vasudura, the career of practice, of practice the, the direct path of meditation. The two careers are not absolutely exclusive. Ideally, there should be a certain synthesis of the two and often we find that monks who follow the study of scriptures usually do some daily meditation, while monks who follow the path of practice often have some proficiency in the scriptures. But generally there's a tendency for specialization. Some monks emphasize the pariyati dhamma, the study of the scriptures. Other monks emphasize patipati dhamma, the practice of meditation. And monks following the two careers generally live in different regions. The monks who follow the career of study usually live in the cities, towns, and villages, while the monks who follow the way of strict practice usually live in the more remote areas, in the forest. This division is not so sharp, since sometimes even in the busiest city monasteries you might find monks who are devoted fully to meditation. While occasionally there are forest monasteries in which there are scriptural specialists, but the regional division between town and forest generally holds valid. The main task of the monks following the career of books is to study, teach, and expound the scriptures of Buddhism. In the Theravada tradition, the main scriptural authority is the Tipitaka, the three baskets of doctrine set down in the ancient Pali language. These three baskets are the Vinaya Vitaka, the book of monastic discipline, the Sutta Vitaka, the collection of the Buddha's discourses and the discourses of great disciples, and the Abhidhamma Vitaka, the collection of philosophical, psychological treatises. And those monks who specialize in study will make it their aim to learn these scriptures as best as possible. And to learn the scriptures for the Buddhist monks in this tradition doesn't mean simply to have read the books, but what specially stressed is memorization. In fact, for the first 400 years, the scriptures of the Tripitaka were not written down at all, but they were transmitted from teacher to pupil 
by way of memorization. And even today, though books are available, memorization is still emphasized. So those bhikkhus who follow the way of study will spend a great amount of time memorizing the text, learning their meaning thoroughly, studying the commentaries written about them, and then when they gain some proficiency in study, they will take on the task of teaching others, of giving sermons and lectures, of training younger monks in the scriptures. And since the study bhikkhus live in the vicinity of the towns, villages, and cities, it is these bhikkhus who come in closest contact with the laity and thus participate in various religious rites of domestic life. Unlike the Christian monks, the Buddhist monks are not completely secluded from contact with the lay world, but they interact with the laity on just about all the key occasions of daily life from birth to death. The main types of involvement in, of the Sangha with the laity are meal invitations, the chanting of suttas, and preaching. Dana, the offering of food to monks, is a great source of merit for lay people. So often a family or a group of town people will invite a number of monks to their home for an alms offering. This will often be followed by a short sermon and then by the chanting of benedictions by the monks. In addition, special chanting sessions are also held from time to time. A group of monks will be invited to chant special protective suttas for the lay people. These suttas are called parita, protective discourses. Then, at periodic intervals, the monks will deliver lengthy sermons. These sermons are given with much fanfare and festivity. These can be attended by large numbers of lay people who make these occasions of preaching their main opportunities for learning the Dharma. On these special Uposita days, the days of the full moon and the new moon, devoted lay people will go to the temples and monasteries for a whole day and night. They'll bring some simple bedding and generally stay overnight. On these occasions, they'll take the eight precepts, living very much like novice monks and nuns. For the day and night of the Uposita, they'll devote their time to meditation, to reciting texts, to asking questions of the monks, to quiet study. And sometimes they might get the chance to listen to several lengthy discourses which might be delivered during the Uposita period. In contrast to the life of the town bhikkhus, the life of the forest bhikkhus is very quiet. Their time is not taken up by the bustle of outer activities, but mostly reserved for their inner work, for the cultivation of the mind, the development of calm and insight. In the forest hermitages, a group of monks will live together, usually under the guidance of an accomplished meditation master. They live generally in small huts situated at a good distance from one another, enough distance to assure each monk of the privacy and seclusion he needs to carry on his practice. And the training of the forest monk follows the ancient pattern coming down from the time of the Buddha. We can find the descriptions of this training in many suttas spoken by the Buddha. We hear how the bhikkhu, after he's left the world, fulfills the rules of training, how he observes all the precepts very carefully and very scrupulously. Then, with this moral discipline as his foundation, he develops contentment with his robe to protect his body, and with his arms food to sustain his life. And it's said that just as the bird goes about with its two wings and lives completely content only to have its two wings, so the monk goes about content simply with his robe and with his arms bowl. Then having developed this contentment, this mind of simplicity, the monk complies himself to control of the senses. When seeing forms, hearing sounds, experiencing any sense objects, he doesn't let his mind be attracted by the desirable sense objects, but he develops 
strong control over the senses, keeping his senses under the command of his mind. All of his actions he performs with mindfulness and clear comprehension. He's mindful when going and coming, when looking forward and looking around, when bending and stretching, when eating, drinking, going to the bathroom, standing, sitting, falling asleep. In all activities, he practices mindfulness and clear comprehension. Then he goes off into seclusion, sits down, crosses his legs, keeps his body erect, sets up mindfulness before him, and purifies his mind of the five hindrances, clears the mind of lust, of ill will, of laziness and drowsiness, of restlessness and worry, and of doubt. Purifying the mind of the five hindrances, he tries to develop the jhanas, the absorptions, and with his, the absorptions as a base, he develops insight and realization. This is the path that the contemplative monk lay down in the suttas, going back 2,500 years, and in the, mon- the forest monasteries of South and Southeast Asia, the same way of life is followed today. The last subject we'll deal with in this talk on the Sangha is the place of nuns in Buddhism. Now, in India, at the time Buddhism arose, women were held in a position of gross subservience to men. The laws of the Brahmins made women dependent on men in all periods of their lives. In childhood, they were dependent on their father, in maturity, on their husband, in old age, on their sons. They were bound down on all sides by domestic duties. Their main role in life was to bear children and do the household work. They received very little consideration as individuals in their own right, and their capacity for spiritual development went largely unrecognized. And it's against this background that we have to view the Buddha's move in creating a bhikkhuni sangha, an order of fully ordained nuns. As we will see, the Buddha himself hesitated to permit women to enter upon the homeless life. And when he agreed to do so, he had to lay down several special regulations for the nuns. But these have to be appreciated against the social background of the time. We shouldn't judge them in the light of our own modern egalitarian ideas. In fact, when we consider what the Buddha did for women in the historical context, we'll be able to appreciate the tremendous courage of his action in forming an order for nuns. The order of nuns was established in the early years of the Buddha's ministry. One year after his enlightenment, the Buddha returned to his homeland of Kapalavattu, and he taught the Dhamma to his people, the Sakyas. A good number of them, men and women, achieved insight and reached different levels of realization. His own foster mother, Mahapajapati Gautami, became a stray mentor, and his father, the king of the Shakyam, became a non-returner. Several years later, the Buddha returned to Kapalavattu to see his father, who was lying on his deathbed. And the Buddha taught the Dhamma to his father, and his father attained arhatship just before dying. Then after the king's death, the Buddha's foster mother, Mahapajapati, went to him and asked if women might be allowed to go forth into the homeless life. The Buddha did not refuse flatly, but he discouraged her from making that request. He said, Please do not ask for women to be allowed to go forth into the homeless life. He repeated this three times. And probably he was thinking that the homeless life was difficult enough even for men to follow. So it would be much harder for these women who had been brought up and sheltered uh, in the sheltered life of the palace. Then when the Buddha left Kapalavattu that time, he went to Vesali, where he was about 250 or 300 miles away. And meanwhile, Mahapajapati had cut off her hair and put on saffron robes and together with a group of Sakyan women, she set out for Vesali. And when she arrived in Vesali, the Venerable Ananda saw her standing there. Her feet were swollen, her limbs were covered with dust, 
and she was very sad and unhappy with tears on her face. And Venerable Ananda saw her and asked her why she was standing there like that. She explained to him that it was because the Buddha would not allow the women to go forth. Then Ananda approached the Buddha and on behalf of the women he asked for permission for the women to go forth into homelessness. And three times he asked and three times the Buddha again didn't refuse, but he told Ananda, do not ask for women to be allowed to receive the going forth. After the third time, the, Buddha, the, the Venerable Ananda used a different tactic. He asked the Buddha, he said, Venerable Sir, is it possible for women to achieve the paths and fruits? Is it possible for them to achieve our hardship? The Buddha said, it's possible, Ananda. Then Ananda said, if this is so, and since Mahapajapati has been so helpful to you, when your mother died, she became your foster mother and gave you milk to drink and took care of you in every way, for this reason it would be good if women could obtain the going forth. And when Ananda said this, then the Buddha said, that he would allow women to go forth and become bhikkhunis, fully ordained nuns, if they would agree to eight principles. These eight principles all have the effect of making the bhikkhuni sangha, the order of nuns, to some extent subordinate to the order of bhikkhus, and of requiring the nuns to show special respect and reverence for the bhikkhus. It seems that one of the great dangers the Buddha foresaw was that the holy life might become corrupted if there was unregulated contact between bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. He therefore laid down these special rules as conditions that would make such contact difficult. And these rules, as we said, also serve to subordinate the order of nuns to the order of monks. And this will doubtlessly raise some objections among modern advocates of equal rights but we shouldn't judge the Buddha against present-day standards. We have to see him against the social background of his time. In those days, women were severely restricted, and even to allow them to go forth into homelessness was a radical measure. If the Buddha had made the two orders precisely equal, he would have risked losing the respect of lay people, and his teaching might have disappeared without flourishing. But by making these rules, he was able to retain the respect of lay people and to ensure that his teaching would thrive. Once the order of bhikkhunis was formed, it attracted women from all different walks of life. Women of royal stock, wealthy women, poor women, ordinary housewives, courtesans, young girls, and so on, left their homes to put on the yellow robes of Buddhist nuns. A good number of these women practiced the path to its goal, achieving our hardship. Some became prominent members of the Sangha, masters of meditation, excelling, some excelling in wisdom, in concentration, in learning, in supernormal powers. A few of the nuns who gave discourses which have been included in the Sutta Pitaka and the verses of the nuns who reached our hardship have been collected together into a single book of the Sutta Pitaka, the Terigata, the verses of the elder nuns. Like the Bhikkhu Sangha, the order of nuns had its own patimoka. This contained over 300 rules, more than that for the order of monks, as some special regulations were needed for women. One of the regulations for the Bhikkhuni Sangha, which was to have unfortunate consequences, was the requirement that a woman novice had to receive full ordination from both orders, the order of monks and the order of bhikkhunis. For several centuries, the bhikkhuni sangha continued to flourish in India. During the 3rd century BC, King Ashoka allowed his own daughter, Sangamita, to become a bhikkhuni. And together with a group of nuns, Sangamita traveled to Sri Lanka with a branch of the Bodhi tree, and she helped establish the Bhikkhuni Sangha in the island of Sri Lanka. After Sangamita had set up the Bhikkhuni Sangha in Sri Lanka, 
Many women from all the different strata of Singhalese society joined the order, which became famous for the saintliness and piety of its nuns. The Bhikkhuni Kuni Sangha continued to thrive in Sri Lanka for many centuries, even up to the 10th century AD. And during this period, it received the support of the king and the royal government and the enthusiastic support of the laity. However, due to a series of invasions from South India, the Bhikkhuni Sangha seems to have died out in Sri Lanka in the 10th century AD. While in India, the order also disappeared. When, we do not know. And since ordination as a Bhikkhuni has to be received from an existing Sangha of Bhikkhunis, when the latter has died out, then ordination becomes impossible and the lineage cannot continue. And it cannot be revived by bhikkhus, by lay people, or anyone else, but only by a Buddha. Thus, when the bhikkhuni sangha disappeared in India and Sri Lanka, this meant the end of the lineage, as a Theravada Buddha sangha had not yet been established in Burma, Thailand, or the other Southeast Asian countries. But though the formal bhikkhuni sangha disappeared from the Theravada Buddhist world, Theravada Buddhist women continued to be drawn to the monastic life. As a result, there have sprung up in the main Theravada countries orders of women who live together as nuns, taking a less formal ordination and following the holy life according to the model of the ancient bhikkhunis. These women generally observe eight or ten precepts. The ten precepts are the same as the precepts for a novice monk. The eight precepts are obtained by dropping the tenth precept and by joining together the seventh and eighth. These women nuns shave their heads and they wear distinctive robes, which may be saffron, brown, or white. They live sometimes in special sections of the monasteries separated from the monks. Sometimes they live in convents of their own. Of their own. Like the monks, some nuns specialize in meditation some specialize in study. Others engage in social services such as teaching, rural development, hospital service, and so on. Unfortunately, these women are not accorded the same reverence that's given to the monks, so they have to maintain themselves either by their own collected funds or by donations from relatives. Materially, their life can be very difficult at times. However, in the present day, as more attention is coming to be paid to the nuns, popular attitudes are beginning to change. In the future, it may be possible for the nuns to receive the outward support they deserve in order that they can live the holy life in its full purity. In addition, the nuns themselves are gaining a stronger collective awareness, and in the several Theravada countries are beginning to form organizations to improve their status, and to increase their means of support. It is to be hoped that these efforts will be fruitful and that in the present day nuns will be able to regain the eminence they enjoyed in the past and to live the holy life as it was intended for them by the Buddha.